we are very happy to have Choba Cheveshwari from DeepMind, I should say. He is the team lead of DeepMind's foundation at our AIR Distinguished Speaker Series. AIR Distinguished Speaker Series is an initiative of the Hariri Institute for Computing. And this brings uh, well-known speakers from all over the world to a broad audience, uh, internal to BU and external to industry partners and affiliates. And so the agenda for today is we have asked a speaker to speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Let me introduce Choba. Choba is the team lead of DeepMind Foundation. And in addition, he serves as a professor of computing science of University of Alberta, and as a principal investigator of the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. He is known for his theoretical work on reinforcement learning and as the co-inventor of Monte Carlo research method, which serves as the basis for much subsequent work. Uh, Professor Shabeshwari has published several books and he's currently serving as the editorial board of the Journal of Machine Learning Research and the Mathematics of Operations Research. And he's going to be co-chair of the upcoming uh, ICML conference in 2022. Uh, so without much ado, uh, let me let uh, Choba speak on, on his interesting topic today about reinforcement learning. Thank you. Thank you, Venkatesh. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to talk about functional approximation and large scale MTP planning. And this is joint work uh, with a number of individuals without whom, of course, this work wouldn't have come to existence. Uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, my PhD student, Galliot Weiss, uh, who has made many significant foundational contributions. Uh, to the material that I'm going to present today. Uh, but it's also important, like uh, other important uh, participants of this uh, effort that uh, we have here uh, are Philip, Barnabas, Nan, Yasin, and Andres uh, from various institutes. And of course, foundations team, General and DeepMind and Amy and Arali, uh, U of A. Uh, I, I'm getting a lot of feedback from a lot of people and I truly appreciate that. Uh, so, what is this talk about? Um, we, we are seeing reinforcement learning uh, breaking through various barriers uh, these days, and uh, it would be nice to understand uh, when can these algorithms deliver at their incredible performance uh, that we see in some of these applications. Uh, so I'm going to start with a motivating example that goes back way be, before this uh, new applications of, of reinforcement learning and, and planning in MTPs, uh, going back to uh, allocation problems from 1963. And uh, this I will use as an excuse to define more formally, uh, what do I mean by this planning problem in MTPs, uh, in large scale MTPs, and, and then we're gonna go into how far we got um, with these problems and then draw conclusions. So the year is 1963, uh, the year that changed the world, uh, lots of things uh, in the air, GFK, CV rides, Beatlemania, Space Race, Cold War, Vietnam, everything. And also uh, some scientists working on allocation processes. So there's this paper by Richard Bamon and Robert Calaba and Bella Kotkin that came out in Madame's com computation. Uh, in 1963, and uh, so this is the paper that maybe studied it all. Uh, I don't know, that's always a little bit contentious to say, but anyways, it's an interesting paper. Uh, so let me just tell you what the problem is in this paper that these authors are looking at. So looking at a very simple problem uh, of resource allocation. So you have some resource uh, of uh, units of some units and, and you have a total resource of B that you have to split up. Okay, let me see whether I can use this interface. No? Okay. Okay, I can use it. 
So B uh, is a total resource and you have to split it up into um, a, a number of parts, H parts. So that's kind of the horizon of the problem. And uh, if you're splitting up this resource into these H parts, uh, for each of the parts, you're gonna get a payoff. And, and the amount of payoff you get for each of the parts is determined by a nonlinear function. So there is this function G1. So plug in A1 into this function uh, G1, and then do that for all the other parts. And this is how much you're gonna make. And uh, we want the optimal splitting of the resource into these parts and the optimal value that we get in this way is going to be B, V star. Generally, that's the optimal value that, okay, that we, um, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out. It's been a while I presented on the iPad luxury of having in-person talks these days. All right, so about this. All right, so, um, so this is the optimal value and, and you can generalize this uh, to the idea of uh, you can have an optimal value. If you have already used so much resources, so that's kind of the state of the process. Uh, X is uh, how much resources we have used so far and we are at stage age and we have to split up uh, the remaining of the resources. And then this is going to be the optimal value that is achievable over this period of uh, the, the remaining periods of uh, going from little age to capital age. And uh, of course, uh, this optimal value, uh, as we know it very well, uh, if, if we're at the very end of the process, uh, this is just uh, the payoff uh, that we can get if we are spending all the resources. And this is because uh, these functions I'm implicitly assuming are increasing. Uh, so the more resources uh, you're using, the more payoff uh, you're gonna get for each of the stages. Uh, so you wanna use up all your resources that remain. So that's B minus X. And so you plug that in into this last payoff function and that's, that's the optimal value that you get there. And for the remaining uh, episodes or, or steps or stages, uh, um, you can just imagine that you already used X and so uh, you can still use any amount of resources for this stage between zero and B minus X. And if you use a certain amount, then you get that, a payoff for that and you're going to get an optimal payoff for the remaining uh, stages uh, from step each plus one to the end. Uh, but you will uh, pay, so to say, for this by using a little bit more resources. So, so the state of the process goes from X to X plus A. And so it's not hard to formally also reason about that uh, the optimal value as defined above has to satisfy uh, these set of equations uh, for each X and for each age. So this is the starting point. Uh, this happened way before this paper and, and this has been mostly the work of uh, Richard Bamon who uh, figured out that uh, we can introduce these value functions and, and with this way, uh, we can solve a lot of optimization problems in this recursive fashion that is shown here. Um, the question is, uh, is going to be a computational question. It's going to be the question of how to uh, compute the optimal value uh, when you haven't spent any of the resources yet. And what is the optimal action uh, for each of the stages or the, the, the first stage? And uh, you could go on recursively. All right. So. Uh, previously to this paper, uh, most of the work and, and there's been books published about this uh, has used discretization. So that, that's what people first figured out. So these resource spaces continues. Why don't we discretize it uh, with a grid of epsilon and then use any method of uh, interpolation and any approximate way of solving for this max. And uh, they were trying to explore this uh, type of ergotums. Uh, so th this was going on before this paper. 
but they quickly realized that uh, if you just slightly generalize these problems uh, by making the resources multi-dimensional, so you could imagine that uh, you have uh, p dimensions, and in each of the dimensions you have to spend some resources. You can spend them independently of each other. And the process is basically the same. Now you just have vector addition. Uh, the problem is that if you apply the discretization and you would demand some sort of uh, epsilon discretization, then even the storage uh, blows up in an exponential manner. And it, needless to say, in 1950s, this seems uh, to be a showstopper even for the smallest problems. Even today, uh, if you look at this, this is an exponential dependence on some quantity. We don't like it. so. Bamon decided to name this uh, the curse of dimensionality. And uh, this is uh, like understanding uh, how to avoid and how to deal with the curse of dimensionality. When, when does it apply? When does it doesn't apply? When is it that it doesn't apply? Is um, one could say uh, is at the heart of the whole field. All right, scary picture. Um, so what's the new idea in this 1963 paper? Uh, the new idea has been to what, what they call the generalized polynomial approximation. So simply put, uh, we have these value functions that we need to represent in some way. Why don't we just like think about uh, using polynomials as a way of uh, approximately representing these value functions rather than the, the crude discretization idea. So we could choose many different polynomials, standard monomials as uh, the Fourier, uh, basis, or we could use Lojan polynomials, Chebyshev polynomials, which are our autonomous system. And so in this paper, in the day, say that, well, let's uh, roll with an autonomous set of uh, system uh, like the Lojan polynomials or the Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, because in this case, if we want to approx if we want to calculate these coefficients in this approximation, then we can simply integrate uh, the function with respect to the basis and we'll get the coefficients. That's just the property of uh, an autonomous uh, basis. And so what remains to be done if you want to approximate the function uh, in this way is uh, to calculate the uh, integrals. And to calculate the integrals, well, they figure that they could use uh, what's known as quadratures uh, for representing curved areas with uh, rectangles or whatnot. And, and uh, this has been uh, around since for a long, long time. And uh, already in ancient times, Newton Coates uh, figures this out that you can make this exact for polynomials of a certain number of degree if you're using R coefficients, you just have to set up some linear system. And in general, this system is going to have a solution. So you can make this formula exact for polynomials and that's really beautiful. And then Gauss also figured that uh, what you could do better. Uh, he's always about doing better. Uh, so you can add an extra r plus one degrees by being clever about the choice of these knots, the x i points. So that there, there is the Gaussian. That's the Gaussian quadrature. Um, so in the Gaussian quadrature, uh, we're finding um, these uh, knots and and the weights such that for any polynomial of degree two r plus one, the integral can uh, of the polynomial can be written exactly. It's an exact equality as this weighted sum of the polynomial values evaluated at these special points. And it, it's really beautiful. Uh, so uh, the authors of this paper, uh, so that we can do this. So in our case, uh, the integrals appeared because we needed to get the coefficients. Uh, and, and this was just the integral of f and the phi of k. So you just plug in this formula and there it comes. Um, we get the coefficients. So putting the, uh, things together, uh, we can uh, write this little computational routine. Uh, for all the node values, we need to calculate uh, um, the, the value function, and then we are going to extrapolate from the node values uh, using uh, just the polynomial approximation or this, uh, this formula that we had. Uh, at the end here. Uh, so here we only need the node, the values of uh, what function f that we want to approximate at this point x of i. So we're gonna calculate these values first. 
So uh, we can do this uh, going from the last stage to the previous stages. Uh, so we start at the uh, stage age. And for all these not values, we can just like read out uh, the corresponding optimal value. That was easy enough. Uh, for the recursion, we can also do this. Uh, so we already have a, a polynomial representing this function. And, um, and then we can just solve for this, uh, this value. And, and notice that we only do this at, at uh, the special values x of i, these knots. And so this is the polynomial approximation that you're getting. And uh, you just calculate the, the coefficients again, uh, as I said, based on the values of the knots, uh, which are pre-calculated. And you can roll back, back, back uh, up to beginning. And, and this, is, this is the procedure that they describe. And it's pretty cool. Uh, so this procedure uh, these days is known as uh, fitted value iteration. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite popular uh, if you uh, change it to neural networks, then you do, uh, you change a few other things as well, I have to say. Then you get some popular method, just called DQN, uh, which has been breaking some of the records uh, that I was alluding to at the beginning. Um, so uh, what's the compute requirement of this procedure? Uh, the storage requirement is just uh, D plus R, just store some coefficients and then some values. Uh, the computational requirement is uh, H, that's the length of the horizon, times D, that's the uh, degree of the polynomial, so the number of coefficients that we need to store, times R, which is like how much effort we want to put into the integration, times the uh, well, uh, the cost of solving for the maximum, and for that, uh, we will still rely on discretization for now. Um, you could try to do other things, but if, if you have uh, some way of discretizing things, then the cost of that discretization comes in. And so if you don't have, if you don't discretize too finely, then you're kind of still fine. Of course, uh, this is a little bit troublesome in a, in a multi-dimensional case, but nevertheless, well, we feel that we are at least making some progress, perhaps. Okay, so, so what if um, we indeed have the multi-dimensional case? Well, apart from this discretization cost, maybe you can use some other numerical procedure for solving for this maxima. After all, you just have to solve some finitely many optimization problems. And if you're lucky, these optimization problems will have some nice structure. Some convexity tends to appear here uh, in these allocation processes at least. And then you can still keep everything under control and things do not blow up necessarily uh, if you want to just like get a better quality solution. Uh, you just like gradually increase DNR, um, and you don't have to uh, suffer from an exponential blow up as before with the discretization case. So the error control is through the choice of these basis functions and uh, how we are performing the, the integration. Uh, so that, that was the big invention. And they, of course, didn't stop here. They ran empirical test on the supercomputer of the day. Uh, which looked exactly like this. Uh, can you imagine that? Um, and, and the results were amazing. Uh, so they are very nice matches uh, between uh, exact values and computed values for various benchmarks. Benchmark number one, uh, very, very good matches. Benchmark number two, very good matches. Uh, dimension and integration effort, not too big discretization effort for the actions not to be either. So they were writing in, in terms of seconds to minutes on this uh, big computer, they were able to calculate this uh, near exact values and they're really amazed about this. And I became really optimistic about this. Uh, they write at the uh, end of the paper as a way of concluding it that finally, if we combine these techniques, polynomial approximations and Lagrange multipliers that they're using that for optimization is that of successive approximations. So that's the idea of uh, performing these computations backwards uh, with value functions. 
there should be very few allocation processes which still resist our efforts. So they, they were really also very much into these allocation processes, but later on they, they generalized it. And I, I will talk about that generalization very, very soon after this paper. Um, generalizations to more uh, complicated things uh, appeared. So the questions that arise uh, after this paper, uh, so the first question is question of approximation. How large should be the degree of polynomials used to approximate these optimal value functions? Uh, so the answer is to be sought uh, using the tools and techniques of uh, approximation theory and systems theory. And I'm not going to touch any of this uh, because even after you decide about uh, that you're gonna use some polynomials or, or whatever way uh, of approximating the value function, that remains the question of, um, how should we perform the computation and uh, of the, the coefficients? And if uh, these coefficients uh, can be computed in particle in polynomial time, and here I'm going to restrict myself to just uh, the case when the number of actions is finite, discrete A. So the polynomial time should be polynomial in the number of actions, uh, the horizon, uh, the number of coefficients that we are after, and the required precision. Uh, the inverse of the required precision volume epsilon. The, that's, that's the question that uh, I'm after. And uh, right, so uh, people didn't uh, sit still uh, since, since uh, these early days. There's been a lot of work uh, on, on using these ideas of uh, value function approximation in various ways, in various systems, in uh, various algorithms, there is a huge, huge list. This led to the field of reinforcement learning uh, in machine learning, but uh, it was also highly influential in uh, in operations research. Uh, whereas they, they used fewer of these approximate techniques, but but they is still a community there who is who is doing that, and also in control. Uh, but uh, the progress on the basic question that I outlined on the previous time of this polymer computation question has not been uh, very fast. In fact, uh, the very first paper that I know of that made some crack on this problem is a paper by Chen Wang, uh, sorry, Wang, I miss your G, and Ben Van Roy. And that's a paper from 2013. So I'm going to start with this paper. So this paper is about uh, optimistic uh, Q learning with uh, linear function approximation. And linear function approximation is just this idea that I presented and is 1969 paper, what they called generalized polynomial approximation. The basis functions could be arbitrary, it wouldn't matter. So um, how do we generalize? Uh, so first, uh, how, how do we make this a little bit more interesting? So from allocation processes to Markov decision processes, the route is very simple. Uh, so uh, here is the equation that we had for allocation processes. But you can generalize this and then just think about that you have a system that has a state X controlling the system. You can choose an action A from an action set of feasible actions. You're going to receive a reward. And then there is a transition to a random next state. So Xi is random here. And after you transit to a next state, uh, well, of course, you can take the optimal value there. Uh, that would be Bauman's uh, principle of uh, optimality and, and take the expectation over the, the randomness of the system. And uh, so if you have a Markov random process, um, there are these ingredients, the reward, the random transitions, you want to collect as much total expected reward as you can and the optimal value function is going to satisfy this recursive set of equations. And uh, so one little thing is that uh, we're going to uh, talk about uh, these MDPs from, from now on. Uh, and the rewards are going to be constrained to, to the zero one interval. All right, um, so from OR or control to AI, important changes, uh, we are replacing uh, X uh, as denoting the state variable with S and, and also we're gonna get rid of this uh, feasible set of actions, which is going to simplify. And another important thing is that we're going to introduce not only the 
optimal state value function v of h of star, but the optimal state action value function, which is just the right hand side, the, this Bellman optimality uh, equations, this re recursive optimality equations, and, and it's going to be uh, quite beneficial to also think about this function. So uh, Q of uh, H of star of S of A is just this right hand side. Um, so that, that's what you need. And, and the notation changes a little bit as well because uh, we're not going to use this transition function F, but uh, mostly refer to transition kernels. So given a state S and an action A, you have a distribution PA of S over next states. And the next state is just coming from that. And, and maybe uh, the process is homogeneous. Uh, it could be homogeneous as well. Anyway, so with this, uh, rewriting this, uh, this paper uh, of uh, Jin Wang and Ben Monroy from uh, 2013, they're looking at deterministic systems. And uh, rather than focusing on state value function approximation, they're focusing on uh, state action value function approximation. So they assume uh, exactly the, the way I, I stated in, in the introduction, that the optimal action value function over all the states and actions can be written as a linear combination of a bunch of basis functions. So, so here, phi uh, collects the values of all these basis functions, the given state and action, and this becomes a vector and just multiply that with this uh, other vector theta star, which is unknown. And then you get the promises that you get the exact optimal values. And I'm going to introduce this notation as well. Of if you have an arbitrary theta, uh, or it could be the theta star, then this inner product, I'm just going to use a QH of S of A and the theta or theta star to, to denote this uh, linear combination. All right. Um, so if we look back at the Bauman equation, uh, we, uh, we could rearrange things. Uh, around this Q star, there is an equivalent way of writing things with Q star. It's going to be recursive as well. And uh, forget just about the max a little bit. You can uh, you can subtract the left-hand side from the left-hand side and you would say that, oh, you have uh, to solve an equation that gives you a zero. So this differences, uh, because the left-hand side and the right-hand side are talking about different stages, they're called temporal differences. So we're gonna introduce this uh, temporal difference-like uh, quantity. So TDH at S, A, S, S prime and theta is going to be just uh, the immediate reward and the maximum value that you would get. Uh, and this is all under the assumption that the, uh, the optimal value function is represented with this theta uh, at the next state. Uh, so S prime here is, is some next state that maybe we observe and uh, subtract from this uh, the prediction of what would be the optimal value, which is uh, just given by QH and the SA and theta star. So with this, the Bauman equations can be written as follows. Uh, this, is, uh, this is this equation denoted by, by this star. Uh, it just says that this, all these TD errors uh, for all the stages, for all the states, and uh, for all the actions, uh, as long as the next state is, is getting from the system dynamics, uh, remember that we have a deterministic system here. So S prime is deterministically chosen. Uh, so this, uh, these quantities have to be zero. Okay, so that's, that's the starting point. That's just bam on saying it. And uh, so what is the ergotum? So the ergotum is a kind of a version space of constraint propagation ergotum. It starts by saying, okay, uh, maybe we have some prior knowledge about how big is this uh, theta star in terms of its norm. So that's, that's your B that has to be correct. So the assumption is going to be that theta star, the norm of theta star is less than equal to B. And then we're going to iterate. Uh, so we pick uh, from the current version space, uh, the feasible uh, thetas, which you think are still possible, any of them. And then uh, we uh, read out the policy from these this action value functions. And, and the way to read out the policy is just like to go with the maximizing action. 
Um, and that's known that if uh, we had the optimal uh, action value function, this would give us the optimal policy. So we're going to test whether this is optimal policy. If this was the optimal policy, we roll out with a trajectory, then we would need to find necessarily uh, because of this equation, the Bauman optimal equation, that all the TD errors are zero. So what we're going to do is that we're just going to say that, uh, well, we got some new data and uh, the data says that uh, with this uh, choices, uh, we need to have um, these, all these equations need to be satisfied. And uh, this, uh, so here it, it was important that even if we miss and our current policy is not optimal, then this equation would be satisfied. So it doesn't matter that this policy is optimal or not, these equations need to be satisfied, no matter what. And so we can restrict the set of feasible parameter vectors this way. And we continue this way until we find that we can't restrict anymore. And then we return. So this is the whole argument. Uh, so the way uh, they wrote it is a little bit different and they, they also use optimism and also the proof is a little bit different, but, but this, is, this is the essence of it. And, and essentially for this algorithm, you can, you can show that for any deterministic system and the assumption that the optimal action value function can be represented with the basis functions given to you, this algorithm is going to stop after a polynomial number of interactions with the system and returns an optimal action at S0. So um, the number of interactions with the systems, so and sometimes we just call that the sample complexity or query complexity. So this result says that this is a correct algorithm and uh, it's a sample or, or query complexity is under control. So in general, uh, when we're talking about sample complexity, we are thinking about that we need to implement a function called get action. And uh, so the previous subroutine that I was talking about was just an implementation of this. Uh, so this function receives a state and it receives maybe um, parameters like uh, the required accuracy of like how well uh, we need to approximate the optimal uh, policy. So that's delta. And uh, this psi maybe we relax uh, the requirement that we only have to do that with high probability, but, but never mind, ignore that. So this function can uh, access the simulator, send queries to it, and then the simulator returns some data. In general, this will be stochastic. In the previous case, it's, it was deterministic. So that made the algorithm the analysis everything very clear. And um, so once uh, this uh, function returns, uh, after a few interactions with the simulator, it returns with an action. And uh, if this action is used in a closed loop fashion, uh, closed loop with the system that is also simulated, then we require that the policy that is being induced, the policy that is being followed is a near optimal policy. So this, this is the planning problem. And this has been introduced uh, somewhat inadvertently by John Rust in 1997 and uh, Karen Smonser and Singh in uh, 2002, uh, this framework, and then they started to ask these questions uh, more rigorously. So I was lying a little bit about this, uh, whether anything happened before 2013, but, but this, uh, so the rest was interested in uh, the approximation questions and then Kirsten, Monster and Singh were pointing out that uh, if you can just build some nice look at trees and you have some nice discounting, then uh, maybe your computation in this lookup planning manner doesn't have to depend on the number of states. Uh, it actually doesn't have to depend on the number of states. So anyways, uh, so you can have different access models as well. I, I will not go into uh, to that. Uh, you can uh, ask me about uh, those details. The point there is that uh, just in a nutshell, uh, if, if you are using features or these basis functions, we need to get access to those. How do you get access to those? Either someone writes you the polynomial basis and then you have global access or you get piecemeal access uh, by just using the simulator and observing the correspond the feature vectors at the states and actions that you're currently visiting. So that's local access. Um, 
So, so what are the results that exist in the literature? Uh, so some of the results are, are in this um, table. And uh, so the first column is, is the source. Uh, we already talked about this paper. And uh, the second column is about how many actions we allow. And the third column is, is about this MDP class. And I will need to explain, but the, the last column just asks you whether a polynomial sample complexity result is feasible or not. And so if I have a check mark, that means that someone proved that polymer sample complexity is possible. And if I have a cross, then that means that someone proved that uh, polymer sample complexity is not possible. Um, so what are these uh, MDP classes? Uh, so uh, the first class, this is just from this paper. So this is the class of all MDPs where the parameter vector theta star is subject to this bond and B. So that's this, this B here. Uh, the number of features is D. Uh, there are H steps in the process. There are A actions, oops. There are A actions and, and uh, the action value function is linearly realizable with the feature. So that's, that's the notation that I'm going to use. So this is all the MDPs uh, that have this property. And, um, and this other class uh, is the, the class of deterministic MDPs. So this just says that for all deterministic Q star realizable MDPs with so on, such and such properties, polynomial sample complexity exists. Uh, so the next result uh, that I want to, uh, to contrast this to is this lower bond result. So I'm not going to talk about this lower bond, but here we are allowing still any number of actions but uh, as long as the number of actions is at least exponential, uh, if we try to change uh, the problem in such a way that we are only changing uh, whether the MDP is deterministic or not. So we allow stochastic dynamics. If we allow stochastic dynamics or uh, even just stochastic rewards, uh, it uh, doesn't matter. So here, the, uh, the for example, the dynamics could be deterministic, P just stands for transitions, uh, and the rewards are stochastic. Then you get uh, this barrier, uh, this blow up of, of the sample complexity. Uh, so we see that there is a stark contrast between deterministic MDPs and, and stochastic MDPs. So this result, unfortunately, doesn't generalize uh, to stochastic MDPs. Um, so a result uh, that uh, is interesting because it can deal with stochastic MDPs and, and enjoys polynomial sample complexity is this paper by Simon Du and, and others uh, that they assume that uh, the features are like you have two sets of feature, one set features, one set is for the optimal value function and the other is for the optimal uh, action value function and you're using them simultaneously and there is also a global access and in this case uh, so that this this only works on the global access so this has to hold everywhere and under this setting uh, somehow this constant propagation idea works out and you can get a polymer sample complexity result and that's a very new result there's a paper by uh, um, the, the third uh, rose paper is a paper by Galliard and, and Philippe Amorti and, and myself. So, so this covered the case when there are many actions. Uh, how about when there are few actions? Uh, so if you have only a constant number of actions, then we have some more polymer sample complexity results. So under V star realizability, we can repeat the feed of the Cheng Wen and Ben Monroy paper and we can get a polynomial sample complexity result with an ergotum that is very similar, a little bit different than theirs. Uh, this also works under local access. And um, in the uh, case, if you have Q star realizability, uh, um, we can only do this uh, with constant number of actions if uh, the transition kernel is deterministic. It's kind of really interesting. Uh, we don't know how to do this for, for completely stochastic MDPs. We can also do this uh, 
under uh, local access, if we start Q star reliability holds for the states which are reachable from the initial state, so that's that's the third row. So, so these are the positive results. And on the negative side, uh, we can prove um, exponential uh, sample complexity lower bounds uh, for cases when the number of actions is, is of this size. So if, if both uh, the number of features and the horizon are relatively large, still polynomial, um, sorry, if, if both are large and, and the action count is large in terms of, of this uh, foundational quantity, uh, then we can get uh, lower bonds for Q star reliability, V star reversal, V star Q star reachable reliability, and even when the transition currents are deterministic. Uh, so let's, uh, in the remaining two minutes, look into uh, why we have no hardness results here. So this is just an ergotum uh, that's, that we call tensor plan. And it's somehow uh, reminiscent to this constraint propagation ergotum of Jenk Ben and Ben Van Roy. So here we have optimal uh, state value functions, so similar notation as, as before. And we have TD errors very similar to what we had before. So these are uh, transition probabilities for next states. So this is just an inner product. Uh, and uh, we're gonna use this uh, notation, uh, extending the, the notation from uh, state value functions to action value functions that uh, this uh, Q, Q values are going to be just the immediate reward and the integrated uh, future value, assuming this parameter vector theta for the value function. And the BAM allocation, this is what we are starting from uh, every time, uh, in this case can be written this way. It's, it's kind of interesting. So the BAM allocation uh, has many equivalent forms. So in this case, uh, since we assume that the optimal value function uh, has this linear parameterization, uh, we know that uh, these TD adders have to go away at least at some action, the optimal action at every state and every, every stage. And so since one of these values, one of the TD values is zero, then their product is going to be zero and, and the algorithm is going to use this algebraic trick of uh, that an existential quantity uh, can be changed into this algebraic form uh, using products. So the ergotum just like have the version space. And uh, one new thing is that it's going to be optimistic about uh, the parameter selection. So it chooses the parameter a vector from the feasible set in every round of uh, running it, um, such that uh, this value gives uh, the maximum predicted value at the initial state as not. And after that, it runs a bunch of rollouts and tests with uh, any of the, the policies uh, under which uh, you would get uh, this, uh, this product to be zero. Like it, one of the elements have to be zero. So just find that element and then use that or use the argmax. But if you see a contradiction, you can, you can immediately stop. So then you don't really have to uh, produce a, a full trajectories. And then when you stop, then you just like add that as, as the critical data and collect some more data, increase the test statistical accuracy. In a nutshell, you're gonna restrict the version space very similarly what we have seen in the paper of uh, Jen ben, ben Van Roy. So after you do this, uh, if you see that the version space doesn't change or you succeeded in uh, rolling out and testing your policy, uh, then you can return with the uh, action at the initial state. So that, that's the whole algorithm. Uh, so the question is, why does it uh, stop changing the theta uh, in polynomial number of times? And then this is just based on rewriting this product of uh, TD expressions. So these are a fine linear in theta so just expand this and, and uh, you could rewrite it with elementary uh, properties, ten tensor products, tensorize the parameter vector. So this notation of like one and T to just stands uh, 
for stacking one and theta on the top of each other to this tensorization. And uh, you can rewrite uh, the, the Bellman equation into this equivalent uh, alternative form where we have successfully separated the parameter vector like a polynomial of the parameter vector and the data that we are collecting of, of the, uh, from the MDP. And we see that uh, this is just a linear uh, system of equations in the nonlinear function of the parameter vector. And because of this, uh, how many times can we fail to uh, set the values correctly? It's at most uh, the number of uh, dimensions in this linear system, which is d plus one to the power of a. So this is why eventually tensor plan is going to find um, the correct set of parameters. So what's the role of optimism? Um, so the, the role of optimism is best explained if we imagine that tensor plan in some uh, state uh, and stage uh, just chooses the first action, which makes the TD error to be zero, not necessarily the maximizing action. And by the corresponding policy, um, then uh, if it happens that that policy has an inner value function, uh, so it's a value function, can be written as a linear combination of the basis functions. It could happen that that's, that's also the case. Not only the optimal uh, value function is linear function, uh, but also the, the value function of this policy is linear, then tensor plan might just return. Uh, and, and we would be in trouble if we didn't choose uh, an optimistic parameter vector. But luckily for us, we are choosing an optimistic parameter vector. And because of this, one can show that when this happens, then the value, the, the value of the policy returned at the initial state is as, at least as large as the optimal value. So why is that? It's because simply because the optimal parameter vector is never thrown out of these uh, version spaces. So since theta star is in theta i, uh, the first equation holds uh, because of the definition of optimism. The second uh, inequality holds because theta star is in theta i. And the third holds because we assumed uh, that the optimal value function can be written with this theta star parameter. So we're done. Uh, whenever tensor plan returns, it returns with an optimal action. It has polynomial complexity, although this is just for a fixed number of actions, right? Uh, but we are not surprised about that because we have seen some more ones as well. So why uh, does hardness happen? I, I don't really have time for covering this. Uh, you can just like uh, manage to, uh, to construct a, a, a problem with an MDP, starting with some semi-bandit uh, structured problem. Uh, it's, it's not a simple construction. And uh, somehow hide the needle in a haystack in a D-dimensional hypercube, like you have to get to one corner, you start some corner, you make sure that the algorithm doesn't receive much information and you can pack this up into an MDP of an appropriate form. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the idea, it's, it's not super simple. Anyway, so with this, uh, we're done. Um, so um, uh, this is the table. Uh, of um, what we know about this problem so far. So one of the pain points, current pain points is that uh, we don't know uh, whether uh, here we could remove this, uh, this constraint that the deterministic, uh, the dynamics has to be deterministic for this positive result. And then we don't know much about the compute time for the green lines except for uh, the result of uh, Jeng Wen and Ben Mandroy, where you also have uh, compute time. And, and here we also, I think we have control for the compute time, but, but not here. All right, um, so are we done? Um, so going back to the quote uh, from uh, the paper, they said, if you combine all these, very optimistic, uh, then nothing is going to resist our efforts. So what are the keywords here? Uh, successive approximations, uh, that's the idea of using maybe value functions, but it's not the way, not, not this backward calculation, not fitted value iteration. It's more like constant propagation and then version space pruning that seems to be giving uh, the good uh, algorithm so far at least. Uh, we also know 
a few things about fitted value iteration, but fitted value iteration may not be that great in this setting. Uh, we also discovered that deterministic dynamics does help. Um, in the case of stochastic systems, optimism uh, helps, which was uh, not yet present in 1963. Um, the allocation problems were continuous. Can we deal with that? Well, not really. We see that the number of actions plays a crucial, crucial role in uh, controlling the sample complexity. As we grow the number of actions, things tend to blow up. Um, and uh, with the approximation theory questions, uh, we didn't answer uh, many of them, but uh, in general, we, we know that noise helps. And there are some, some nice results in, in, that, uh, in that direction. All right. So there are a bunch of things that are left, but uh, I, I'd rather stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Jova. I guess uh, we can all clap. Uh, they're all on Zoom, or there's also a room in which they're uh, looking at your uh, wonderful talk. And uh, I can take any questions uh, and pass it on to Chova if you type it on the on on the you know chat window. This is a very unusual way of asking questions, but. Uh, <laughs> I don't see the chat window, right? You don't see the chat window. Yeah, so, so uh, am I to understand, Choba, that uh, your lower bounds are somehow all uh, minimax uh, you know, versions of uh, that, uh, that you're talking about here? Are there, is there room for doing something less, uh, less minimax, more the average case scenario? Because, at the end of the day, these types of techniques do work, right? Uh, where you do not restrict yourself to finite action spaces in the way that you have. Right. So I would answer this by uh, by saying that I think that the right way to think about is that uh, there are different classes of these MVP problems. And um, so look at this it's table, right? So, so the classes of MDPs that we are talking about, so yeah, so the very first thing is that yes, the answer is like these are worst case results for these MDP classes uh, that I'm talking about. And we see that as we're changing uh, things like which MDP class we are looking at, the worst case results tend to change. So here, what we have found is that uh, maybe this is like just a starting point is that if we, uh, try not to assume too much. So we end up with a huge class, right? So we only assume that the optimal state value function is linearly realizable or the optimal action value function is linearly realizable. Uh, then uh, the uh, defining quantity of the, the complexity of the problem tends to be number of actions, right? Like if you have constant number of actions, the problem is easy. If you start to have more actions, poly number of actions uh, or more, then the problem becomes hard. And there are some other cases as well. Uh, so similarly, you can, you can imagine restricting the problem in other ways, right? And uh, so that rather than, I, I wouldn't go average case because like, I don't know what uh, distribution you want to use or anything like that, but certainly there is life beyond this uh, really big classes, right? So you could put more restrictions on the uh, MDP. For example, one of the popular restrictions under which you have positive results, lots of positive results, um, is that if for all the policies in the MDP, the action value function is linearly representable with the features, then you can have nice positive results, controlled computation cost, controlled sample complexity, even controlled regret. So that's uh, there's the inner approximation. And then here we're talking about these big classes. We see that maybe these are a little bit too hard. And so I think that there is a lot of room for, for exploring what, what lies in between indeed. I see. Well, how about uh, you talked a lot about uh, computational complexity, but uh, there must be a parallel direction in terms of statistical complexity, right? 
I guess uh, I guess uh, the proper interpretation how does though, this interact uh, with uh, statistical versus computation. I mean, especially once you get to versioning, then you know you can relate it to a lot of that. So, so let let me clarify a little bit about these results. So, uh, most of these results are, uh, especially the lower ones, are information complexity type of results. So they are statistical results. Uh, the upper bounds as well. Uh, it's harder to control. So. I set out at the beginning, it's true, asking a question about computation, but what I ended up doing is was rather talking about sample complexity. And of course, for lower bounds, that's fine. If your sample complexity is high, then the compute cost has to be high as well. For upper bounds, it's not so fine if the sample complex sample complexity could be low, but maybe there is still a computational barrier. And this is indeed what we don't know whether there is. The, for the first three rows on, on the table that I'm showing here. Uh, so so that's, that's kind of the fuller picture of this. So these, these results were mostly mainly statistical or information complexity results and the lower bonds, the, these are the tools that we are also using. I see, so I, I, and what about online versions of this? Right, uh, so these are like, some of these results are online in the sense that um, we're talking about like an MPC setting, uh, if, if you know that thing from control. Yeah. How to go faster back. Moving, moving horizon control. Yeah, it's um, this picture, right? right? Like you're in a loop and within the loop, you're doing your computation. This is online. And you want the induced policy to be good fun. Uh, so, so these results are online in this sense. Uh, they're not controlling the regret though. Uh, so the positive results, except for the paper of Jen Bang and Ben Van Roy, they're controlling the regret. They're more like uh, controlling the, the, the value. Uh, I was talking about the finite horizon setting. So, so that it's, it's super clear. What you want is that you want to go in with your planner and go up onto the end of the stage or the stages at the end of the process. And you want the total reward collected to be close to the optimal total reward. In this case, uh, you just have one pass, but you're interacting a lot with the simulator in between, right? Like you're, you're allowed to do that. Uh, so it's not online in the sense that uh, if you didn't have simulator access, uh, then you wouldn't be able to do that. That would be con just controlling the regret. And the Jing Wen and Ben Van Roy paper is indeed doing that. Um, and there are a few other papers that are doing that, but, but mostly these results are focusing on, on this planning scenario. One reason I, I like the planning scenario is because you have a little more, more flexibility and, um, for this hard, for, for these big classes of MVP problems, I think we need to use all the flexibility that we can have. Uh, even uh, with this much flexibility, we find that a lot of these uh, problems uh, appear to be hard. So along these lines, uh, there's a question here. I don't know whether you can see it. Gregorio Newell has this okay. question. He says that all these negative results suggest that it is probably too ambitious to try and compete with a true optimal policy. Perhaps one way out is to relax the notion of optimality and sub set some more modest goals. Do you have any thoughts as to what alternative goals would be worthy of pursuing? Yeah, indeed, uh, we do have a positive result. Um, the tensor plan ergotum that I talked about, that was the second ergotum. That ergotum can compete with, even, even if uh, the optimal value function is not linearly representable, but there is a policy whose value function is linearly re representable, then it can compete with the value of the best of those policies. Uh, so that, that's a less ambitious goal and TensorPlan uh, is able to achieve that. Uh, so that, that's a stronger result in this sense. 
Now the question is whether this would also change if, if we change uh, the problem setting this way, uh, whether it would change any of the negative results. So for this, uh, I have to say, no, it, it wouldn't change any of the negative results, unfortunately. So this type of change wouldn't help. What else could we do? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, so one of the things we already talked about is changing the problem settings uh, by, by changing the MDP class, uh, restricting it somehow further. Um, Competing with, um, yeah, so, so far I just I can just say that uh, like the counter examples are constructed in such a way that uh, there is no obvious way of relaxing the optimality requirement that wouldn't become trivial uh, or the complexity results still stand. Uh, so the, the way that I can reasonably think about these relaxations of uh, the requirements, the, the way I, I describe, the lower bonds still stand. So that doesn't really help. I see. Yeah. All right. I think uh, if you guys have more questions, uh, you can contact Shoba directly, right? Uh, send him emails. He's always welcome to yeah. new questions. At least I found him to be very interactive that way. So and with this, uh, we'll end the talk right now. Uh, thank you very much, Shoba, for a wonderful Thanks. Talk. Thanks for having me.